I'm going to turn the afternoon program over to Dr. Dan Loy. He's our first speaker, and uh, uh, Dan and I have worked some together um, on extension programming. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, Dan is a native of Illinois and has been at Iowa State and is the current director of the Iowa Beef Center. And uh, so it's just super to collaborate with him. Appreciate him being on the program. I know him and a large contingency of folks from ISU Extension were down in Kansas this week for the BIF meetings. And so it actually worked out pretty conveniently to come here, other than they've been away from home for a while. So they're probably anxious to get back to Iowa. Uh, so Dan's going to discuss. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is common is you send in silages and you get the stuff back, and then what does that mean? Especially for producers, I think some of that's challenging. And then we've already discussed this some today, is what makes a good silage versus a bad silage. So we thought that was such a, an easy topic that Dr. Loy would want to take on that task. So <laughs> appreciate you being here, Dan. And he's now the MC, so I ought to be careful for the rest that's of that. That's right. I get the last word now, right? Although there's that closing comments at the end, and I'm pretty sure Galen will have a, find a way to get the last word there. <clears throat> well, Galen, I, first of all, I want to say I, I really, uh, we, the, the Iowa Beef Center, Iowa State University, we really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this. Uh, this is uh, uh, an, an effort that uh, uh, we think is really valuable at this time. And there's uh, a lot of opportunities there, and hopefully you'll gain something uh, throughout the course of today that you can take home and use. Uh, I also want to acknowledge, Galen, don't leave the room yet. I, I want to, Galen did most of the heavy lifting for this meeting. So, I mean, it was a partnership, but he really did the vast majority of all the work. And I think he deserves a round of applause for all the work he's done. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, as Galen mentioned, he, this is the topic that he gave me, and uh, and uh, we're going to. I'm going to. Uh, may, some of this, there's probably 30 or 40 people in this room that could easily give this presentation as well as I am. It's, uh, I'm going to go back to some of the basics in terms of things that we might look at in terms of nutritional analysis in in um, uh, silages uh, feed, or feed analysis for silages. Um, if you, if you send in a feed test today, you might get 50 or 60 numbers back. And the interpretation of that can be challenging. And a lot of the, those numbers come from a lot of work that's been happening in the dairy industry. And as the beef industry, I'm not sure we're ready to interpret some of those numbers yet. We need to do more, find more research to really understand how they fit in. And we'll talk about some of those as we get through this today. Before I get too much farther down the road, I want to acknowledge Garland Dalkey. Where's Garland? Garland, raise your hand. Garland's a scientist with uh, the Iowa Beef Center. A lot of the information I'm going to share with you today, Garland helped me with. Um, if you've used any of the software at Iowa State, the Brands Ration Program, Feedlot Monitoring, Estrus Sync Planner, uh, Garland's probably, Garland is the one that put that software together. Uh, but he also uh, has a good background in ruminant nutrition as, and has uh, helped me a lot in terms of putting this particular presentation together. So I want to acknowledge Garland. Towards the end, where I'm going to share a new software tool that Garland wrote to help evaluate different types of silages. And so that's going to be kind of where we wrap this presentation up today. Before I get started, and I guess, you know, at this, I've been doing this long enough that, uh, that, uh, I can start to be a little bit of a historian, Terry. <laughs> and so, so um, you know, there was a time in Iowa when silage really was the king. And, um, and I went back through our files just to see what I could find along those lines. And I found a couple documents that I want to share with you. And this was from our files. I just took this and took a screenshot of it today. And this is from somewhere in the mid-1970s. It's from a uh, a uh, fact sheet that was put together for a series of cattle feeder meetings during that time frame and talks about the advantages of corn silage. And uh, this was a time where silage was king. The, one of my predecessors, Mitch Giesler, made a career out of promoting corn silage for finishing cattle. And these are the things he talked about. Maximum TDN per acre, maximum beef production per acre, complete mechanization. Now, complete mechanization then was upright silos with automatic uh, uh, 
silo unloader, and we had a lot of those 300 to 500 head feedlots uh, at that time when I started in, in this position. So that was important. But the other part of that was that, and this is another fact sheet from our files, and this was around 1970. Now, this is before my time. You should know that, okay? <laughs> that was before my time. But, but I just want to point a couple things out. Also during that time frame, a typical feeding program was all the silage they would eat, usually an automatic silo unloader, and then about 1% of their body weight. So that was a typical feeding program. The problem, and with that, we got maximum beef production per acre. The cattle would gain about two and a half pounds a day with a feed conversion somewhere between eight and 10. So the first 10 years of my career, I spent encouraging producers basically to feed less silage. To, <laughs> to uh, uh, we, we put in a lot of uh, uh, feed wagons with scales under them. We encouraged TMRs, a lot of fence line feed bunks, and the net result was, was basically uh, feeding less silage. And that was kind of the major extension program we had for the first 10 years. So I, I just bring this because it's kind of ironic because we're back to talking about silage and its value for feedlot cattle. The thing that's interesting is that today, some of those advantages that we talk about are still there. Um, we still get the beef, most beef production per acre. If you look at yield of nutrients per acre of, of crop ground, uh, that's, still, that's still a factor. It's a homegrown roughage source. We don't have to buy forage from uh, somewhere else. So that's, that's another factor. Of course, we've had corn stalks. That's become, uh, that's in virtually every feedlot diet in Iowa now. Um, but corn silage does that. But the other thing, and this was alluded to a little bit when, with uh, Dr. McDonald, is that it allows early harvest for uh, nutrient management in feedlots. So in the farm feedlot system, corn silage offers uh, some windows to do some things from that standpoint, and it fits well with cover crop systems. We're seeing a lot of uh, producers using that early harv earlier harvest of corn for corn silage to include uh, uh, cover crops either for grazing or for a second rye silage uh, harvest, you know, a second crop along those lines. And in, in Iowa, nutrient management, nu the nutrient reduction strategy, water quality are all things that are on everyone's mind. And looking at the whole farm feedlot as a system is something that we need to do to, uh, to improve our overall efficiency across the whole farming enterprise. Okay, that's not what I was asked to talk about, so we'll move on to that. But I just had to take a few minutes to talk about, uh, um, you know, kind of at least put, give you my perspective in terms of why I think this is the right time for this conference. Oh, one more thing. The best feature about corn silage, there's no net wrap, okay? <laughs> All right, so what I was asked to talk about was a little bit about corn, about qual or silage quality basics. And so, uh, and again, uh, for, uh, for you graduate students that are here, this is probably something that Galen's taught you already. If he, and so, uh, so I may ask you to come up and, and give parts of this. It, but, uh, so what we're, in, what we're really interested in, if we kind of boil it down, take a step back, obviously we're interested in nutritional value. If you work with your nutritionist, you need to understand what you have in terms of nutrients in that so that you can properly balance it uh, with supplements or with other grains and co-products. So we need to know the nutritional value. But then you heard a lot about fermentation today, and so how well was the, ferment, how well was the fermentation process? What, what, how can you evaluate whether that feedstuff went through a proper fermentation? That's the second part. And along with that, storage and feed out. Uh, silage can be very good in quality, but if it if it's, uh, goes through aerobic conditions during storage or during feed out, then you it changes and you can lose, you lose a lot of that. So the fermentation characteristics look at both of those. And then finally, uh, how can we use our nutritional analysis along with some yield information to really come to economic value to make decisions about, about uh, where to raise the, in your farming enterprise to, to uh, harvest silage, what uh, varieties to use and that type of thing. And that's when we'll get to the, uh, the tool that Garland uh, has been working on. So, let's start first with dry matter. And, and it, it, corn silage is a high moisture feed. Dry matter measurements are really, really important. And there's different ways you can evaluate dry matter. Um, 
if, you know, if you talk, the, this afternoon we'll hear about studies evaluating dry matter, and in, in those studies, when we measure dry matter, we'll do it using an oven dry matter method. Um, I, Galen can tell you the specific protocol that's used for that. Um, most of the laboratories will use the same protocol. Um, and, and most of our estimates of energy values and fiber values are based on that oven dry matter method. Now, there are other ways to do that, more sophisticated methods. You know, a lot of the energy value in silages are organic acids that are driven off in the silage process. So there are chemical measurements of water. Uh, Carl Fisher titration is one. And so if you have specific interest in looking at that, um, and especially from a research standpoint, we often do that. Uh, but no, just knowing the dry matter is important. And because it changes, dry matter is one that you might want to do more frequently, even on a monthly or a weekly or even more frequently than that. And there are methods you can do that right on the farm. Uh, the, the microwave method is one. Um, the coster tester was mentioned earlier is another simple way. You may get slightly different numbers than you'll get from a more precise oven dry matter, but you get, more, you get numbers more quickly, and so you can do it more frequently. Uh, so dry matter is, I start there because we can't overemphasize the importance of monitoring dry matter and measuring dry matter in this process. Chemical, so now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit, but um, I want to talk a little bit about measurement of carbohydrates, because really a lot of what we do in terms of evaluating um, the value of feedstuffs, specifically silages and forages, is looking at the carbohydrates because they're related to the energy content. And that's really the main reason we're feeding, at least the growing cattle, we're feeding, feeding corn silages for its energy value. And so I'm going to, this is kind of a complicated chart in some ways. I tried to recreate this from some information that we've used in class. Actually, you should know that there's a very good table like this in the new nutrient requirements of beef cattle, formerly known as the NRC. Where's Galen? Um, um, in the, there's a really nice carbohydrate chapter in that document that has a new uh, table that, that kind of depicts some of this information that breaks down the, the carbohydrate information. So that's, a, that's a, a good resource to look at. But this is how forages have been evaluated since about the mid-1800s. This is the proximate analysis system. And uh, if you go back in Morris's feed and feeding, the, the energy values, the TDN values, were based on a chemical composition that, that looked something like this. So we measured, whoops, we measure uh, crude fiber, ether extract, crude protein, and ash, and then the nitrogen-free extract is kind of the carbohydrates that are determined by difference. So this is, a, and then basically each of those has a digestibility coefficient that's used to determine a TDN. That's, for many, many years, was the method that was used to evaluate carbohydrates, and we can still get crude fiber, we can still get all of these elements in a feed analysis. So we may see this reported from time to time. What's more typical today is the Van Soos determination of fiber. So that's the NDF, which is the cell walls, and the, the ADF, or acid detergent fiber, components of, of the fiber, okay? And so this is, kind of, this is how that would break down. We have the cell wall constituents, which are partly uh, digestible, partly nutritive manner, or matter. We have nitrogen, soluble carbohydrates, and ash, which are nutri nutritive man matter, which is the NDF solubles. And then within this, we have the cellulose, which is partially digestible, the hemicellulose, which is digestible. And then those are utilized then to estimate the TDN or energy in, in many cases. Okay, So we'll, that's kind of the breakdown in terms of what we're trying to do with the fiber analysis. So what we'll get, is the nutrient detergent fiber is a number that, because it's all of the fiber, includes the, the non-digestible, partially digestible, and the highly digestible, it's something that's usually related to intake. You'll hear our, our beef cow nutritionists using NDF as an estimate or a factor in estimating what the intake should be on low quality forages, average quality forages, and so forth. The ADF has a high relationship to digestibility, especially within classes of feedstuffs. So within alfalfa, within corn silage, there's been enough research to get a really good estimate in terms of the relationship of ADF to energy. 
So many times when you send a feedstuff, a silage sample into a forage lab and get an energy value determined, it is estimated from the acid detergent fiber. And so there's a high correlation there. And, it, and that's because it includes that partially digestible material cellulose, okay? Um, the, there are also summative equations that use other components in addition to ADF, NDF, fat, um, and, and so forth. So some labs will use some of those summative equations. One from Ohio is one of the more common ones that you'll see. And um, for, for corn silage, um, that's also a very useful equation to use. So depending on your nutritionist, depending on your experience, you may choose to use some of those. A lot of times the labs will give you a list of energy values that long with every calculation that they've done. So you just get to pick the one you like. Um, so th those are, are uh, <coughs> common nutrient analysis. Along the same um, lines in terms of carbohydrates, uh, we heard a lot about starch content. We'll hear more about starch content this afternoon as we start looking at some of the research that Galen and others here at Nebraska are doing. Um, basically, it's uh, indicative of the amount of grain per ton of forage, so it would relate to maturity. Higher sugar content, uh, sugar is another carbohydrate that can be measured in forages, is, um, would be higher in immature for, more immature forages uh, or drought stress forage. Um, and it can also, uh, as you heard this morning, uh, relate back to the, uh, the effectiveness of fermentation. So back to the energy values, the, the only direct way to measure an energy value is to do a balance study. But um, you, you're not going to fund Galen to do a, a digestion study for every feed sample that you have. He'd probably like for you to, but you're not going to do that. Uh, so we need the best estimate we can get, and that's either going to be through the relationship to fiber, usually ADF, or through one of the, the summative equations that I mentioned. The other way is through in vitro digestibility, and we're seeing a lot of labs now providing in vitro digestibility as an estimate of, of energy. And that has a lot of value with the more common feedstuffs like corn silage. So in vitro digestibility is basically a fermentation in the laboratory using rumen fluid. So we're using biological materials to do this. So, so there, because of that, the diet that the animal's on, the intake that the animal's on, where the, where the rumen fluid came from, can affect some of the, the values. So it's better if you're comparing feedstuffs to send them all so they're in the same run because there can be some differences from run to run because of that biological variation. But still, it's, um, it's a good uh, uh, method. It monitors the digestion by the rumen bacteria, and uh, as I mentioned, the results depend on the diet and other factors related to, to the animal. Um, the length of fermentation is important, and many labs will offer different lengths of fermentation. And a lot of that depends on how the diet's being fed. For dairy cattle, uh, 30 hours is kind of the constant, but, and that's related to the rate of passage of a typical diet, lactating dairy cow diet. For growing beef cattle, uh, we might suggest that 48 hours might be more useful. Uh, and that's up to you. You can choose which one you want to use. For finishing cattle, 24 hours might be more indicative of what uh, what would be appropriate for that animal. So, so depending on what your, uh, your uh, uh, final feed or how you're going to use the particular feed stuff, you may choose to look at uh, different lengths of time when using in vitro digestibility. Uh, starch digestibility was mentioned earlier. Some labs offer this. Often it's a seven hour in vitro starch digestibility. Some of, the, some of that may also, in addition to the fermentation uh, uh, outcomes that were mentioned this morning, this may also be a, a measurement that can help you evaluate the kernel processing or the the amount of processing of the starch um, before going into the in vitro digestibility. Okay. Protein, I'm going to leave a lot of this to Andrea. She's going to talk about protein in, in her presentation, but basically we're looking at quantity. Now, corn silage is not, a lot, it's not a great source of protein, but it does have protein, and it does have variation in protein. So we need to understand that so your nutritionist can properly balance for that protein. But in addition to that, if we go through an improper fermentation, some of that protein that's there can be heat damaged, and the acid detergent insoluble crude protein is an estimate of the extent of the heat damage. 
Also, protein degradability and solubility are important, especially as we look at metabolizable protein systems. And again, I'll leave that to, to Andrea. The ammonia as a percent of uh, crude protein is um, a measure of a secondary fermentation. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So ammonia is something we might look at uh, as, as an indicative or as an indication of some problem after the, or during or after the fermentation process. Of course, mineral content, I, I'm office next to Stephanie Hansen, so, and she's a mineral nutritionist, so if I don't mention minerals or, or all the Iowa State people um, here don't tell her I mentioned minerals, then, then I'll be in trouble when I go back to the office. But we need to know the, the mineral content uh, as with any other nutrient so that we can properly fortify and balance the diet for, uh, for the uh, uh, deficiencies. Uh, fermentation and organic acid. Now we're getting into a lot of the things that were discussed when we, when we heard about the basics of silage fermentation this morning. And I think there are a couple speakers this morning that could give this part of the presentation a much, uh, give it much more uh, uh, credit than, than I will hear. But a lot of what we look at from a standpoint of evaluating silages has to do with how well that fermentation happened, and then what we did or didn't do or did not so well after the silage had been fermented. So pH, um, I said f I had four as the target, uh, maybe it's five, I, but a low pH, that's, that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're trying to do is stabilize that material with a low pH. Lactic acid, something less than five is good. All these numbers I'm giving you here are numbers that I've kind of collected from uh, references, from some of the recommendations and extension fact sheets and some of the laboratories, and they vary. And so these numbers are, are ballpark guidelines. Your laboratory, your nutritionist may look at something different, uh, but I will tell you that more lactic acid is better than less, okay? So lactic acid greater than 5% is good. We'd like to see acetic be a low number. That uh, suggests that less lactic acid was produced, less than 1%. Butyric, zero would be a good number. Um, less than 0.5% is what some uh, have suggested. So one of the thumb rules that, that um, we have in the paper is that 70% of all the acids or more should be lactic, is indicative of a good fermentation. And then the other uh, ratio is the lactic to acetic ratio uh, should be greater than 3.0. And I'll show you some samples. Actually, these are some samples that Garland had collected over the last year or two that show some differences here in a minute that we'll see some huge differences in this ratio here in just a bit. Uh, ammonia, again, ammonia should be less than 12 to 15 percent of the crude protein. Um, that's indicative of a slower drop in pH than we would like. And then ethanol production greater than 3 percent is um, an, an indication of a yeast fermentation, and we heard about that this morning as well. So those are just a few numbers in terms of evaluating the fermentation. The, so if we have a poor fermentation, then we start running into potential for some real anti-quality factors. I'm just going to hit on these very briefly, but then we start looking at mold and yeast counts. Now these, now we did see some data this morning where Spoiled feed depressed, depressed fiber digestibility and is, has um, lowered palatability. That, there's no question that's true, but just the presence of mold or yeast is not, necess is not necessarily a problem. Uh, but it's an indication that there could be a problem. So evaluating that, especially for silage that you have some suspicion about, is a useful first step. The problem with molds is that they can produce mycotoxins, and that's where we get some concern. So if you have silage that have, um, you have concerns about potential for mycotoxins, that's when we need to get the veterinarians involved and work with your veterinary diagnostic lab to evaluate those. Iowa State, we have a, a good toxicology department. Dr. Steve Inslee has been in Nebraska. Many of you know Steve uh, coordinates that, um, and so that's, that's a good role. Um, one of the bigger, or one of the really where we have potential to actually have death losses with improperly fermented silage is with listeria. And if you have symptoms along with low quality silages where listeria, 
listeria is suspected, then that's when you really need to get the veterinarians involved and your nutritionist as quickly as possible. And uh, in Nebraska, I have it on good authority that you have a pretty good bacteriology department in your veterinary diagnostic lab. So that's kind of an inside joke, but we'll tell you about that later. Um, so the nutritional value, all, with all of the fermentation values is important no matter what you're feeding the silage to, whether it's dairy cattle, growing cattle, finishing cattle. But when we start looking at, at on the finishing end, then there's some additional factors. And we, well, this was touched on in our discussion a little bit later. When we start looking at corn silage as a roughage source, now we're we're interested in the effectiveness, or uh, we're, we're supposed, now it's physical effectiveness of the fiber, or physically effective NDF, okay? And so that's another, uh, that's another factor that we can evaluate, and that we can do it here. Some laboratory uh, will provide this service as well. And the problem is, we're kind of working against ourselves in, when we start looking at effective fiber and silage. Um, Fine grinding improves the silage preservation. We heard that earlier today. Um, but it also reduces the particle size and can reduce the effective fiber. So we at least need to know it, as Eric said, so that we can balance for it appropriately or add additional fiber or change inclusion so that we can balance for it. So evaluating the eff physically effective fiber is something that we need to start looking at if we're going to rely more on corn silage as a roughage source in the feedlot. And the other thing, that, and, and it gets to Garland's question earlier, and we've discussed this, I don't know that it's been evaluated in feedlot cattle, but does shredlage have a role for using silage as a, a, a more of a, an effective fiber source? Um, I've not seen any studies on that. That's more of a question. It is longer in particle size. Uh, if it's still, if you can provide a silage that's longer in particle size and still packs and ferments, well, that I think has some potential, but at this point, it's something that, that we feel like just needs to be evaluated, at least unless someone else knows of some research that's evaluated that. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on time, Gar uh, Galen? You're now in charge, I know, but I can't remember when I started. I think I have about 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we can't see this very well, or I guess you can back here, but this is four silages, and uh, Galen, one of the parts of my title was what's a good silage and a bad silage. So there's two good silages and two bad silages up here. And I'm not gonna have a quiz, I'm just gonna go through these. And uh, I'm not as good as some other of our staff members and graduate students in terms of doing animation, so I'm just gonna point and shoot here a little bit. Um, this is a good silage that's dry, and this is a good silage that's wet, okay? And I didn't pick this just because of your research, Galen. It's just what Garland had in his files. But this one had a dry matter of 24.7%. This one had a dry matter of 42%, pH 3.9 and 4.7, so a little higher pH with the dry silage, so not as extensive fermentation as you would have here. And if you just look at these numbers, protein, fiber, they're relatively similar. When we get down here, there's some differences in the fermentation. Notice that the lactic acid is higher with the wet silage, but the acetic acid is both low, and if we look at the lactic to acetic ratios, they're both very high, indicating that even though the drier silage wasn't fermented as extensively, this would suggest that it was a, a good quality fermentation, or at least it's fairly well preserved. So that's one interpretation of this, and then you can look at all the nutrient values that are listed there. The silage experts that are in this room may have different interpretations than I do, and I'd welcome those as well. These are a couple different samples. This spoiled sample actually wasn't spoiled. One of the things I'm gonna talk about here towards the end is following instructions for submittal of your, your uh, silages to the, the laboratory. And this is one that actually spent the weekend in, uh, where was it? In a mailbox. So it spent a weekend in a mailbox. So the fact that it was spoiled was because it sat aerobically over the weekend. 
And this is what happens when that. So this is what happens when you, you take a pile of silage and, and leave it aerobic for that period of time. And then the one on the, right, uh, the far right is a sample that was just on the edge of the bunker. So it's kind of that spoiled, semi-spoiled part of a bunker of decent, uh, decent, otherwise decent corn silage. So the dry matter, they're both uh, 35, 39%. Their pH is in the fours. That would suggest that, that it's okay, but they did ferment. But we start looking down here at some of these values, the lactic acid here, is less than 1% and acetic is 0.44%. So that ratio is less than one to one. So that's not what we're looking for. So that, uh, that's what happened during that spoilage process. This one, um, we, um, we, you, you follow it down here. Here we have that ammonia production. So we had a higher ammonia as it, as it related to crude protein than we'd like to see. So that's, that's uh, what, suggest that that fermentation wasn't as quality as we'd like to see. There's a lot of different, and there's examples of other silages that uh, Lalleman brought for us to look at that you can interpret and look at as well today. But this is just kind of a, an example of some, some good silage and some not so good silage, or, or at least some that we had uh, uh, available. So what's important to evaluate? Well, uh, fermentation quality is important for all classes of cattle. I mean, if we're gonna, you know, from not just for feed quality, but also for minimizing storage losses and minimizing the economic losses that go along with poor fermentation. Um, for growing cattle, that energy estimate is really quite important. That's what est that's where we that's why we feed it, and that's why uh, uh, why we need to uh, evaluate that. For finishing cattle, then we also need to start looking at the affected fiber content, or at least evaluating that so we know how we can effect, most effectively incorporate that in as a roughage source in the feedlot. And then finally, uh, well, not finally, but along with the feed analysis, make sure you follow the instructions. Maybe you need to freeze it. Maybe it needs to be uh, shipped overnight. Whatever the instructions are to make sure that that feed, when it arrives at the laboratory, is the same feed stuff that you shipped. The last thing I want to do is share a, a software program that was just recently uh, put together. Garland's the author of this program. And this was taken after a program that was developed at the University of Wisconsin for the dairy industry called uh, Milk, Milk 06. And basically what Milk 06 does is it takes the nutrient analysis, mostly the energy analysis, uh, or the nutrient analysis of silage, and then you, uh, along with the yield of the silage, it estimates milk production per acre. So this is a kind of a version of that, but here we're looking at beef production per acre. And so I'm gonna bring this up very quickly here. You got, oh, you got me, okay. And the URL for the program, you can download it for free from the Iowa Beef Center is there. So basically what we do, in, you know, any computer program that outputs are only as good as the inputs. And so um, estimates of silage yield over on the left uh, can be estimated from, from corn yield. The cost per acre, you need to have some production costs or an estimate of production costs for, uh, for that. So we have, we have the, the output of the silage, the cost of the silage, and then we have the nutrient profile, okay? And so you can either put, plug in directly any M and any G values of the silage, or you can estimate it based on a nutrient analysis. In this case, if you have in vitro digestibility or undegraded NDF uh, digestibility, it will use that information and then calculate an estimate. If we were feeding this as the majority of a diet to growing beef cattle, what would be the value of these silages in terms of beef production per acre. He also has a, a component where we can credit the nitrogen protein differences because there are protein differences as well. And so basically we get to uh, the, the, the cost of the beef, the value per ton of, uh, per acre, per ton of dry matter, and then it will put a rank of, of those. So if you wanna compare varieties, if you wanna compare fields, um, it's a tool that can be somewhat helpful in that. Okay, so can we go back to the slides? <laughs>
Very good. Uh, just the final thing is, you know, as we look ahead, the dairy industry, I think, is, is ahead of us in a lot of ways in terms of different nutrient analysis and how they contribute to milk production. Um, but I think we're, we're heading there. You know, some of the things they're looking at are, are uh, rates of digestion that can go into some of the, like the Cornell nutrition models. And as we learn more with the new nutrient requirements of beef cattle, uh, in the, their level two model or the mechanistic model, uh, we may start using some of those same factors for beef cattle. I'm not sure we're quite ready to do that today, but, but we may be heading there. And so with that, I'm gonna stop and see if there are any questions, try to keep us on time and, uh, and go from there. Yes, sir. What are the factors and or environmental conditions that lead to listeria? List okay, <laughs> then there may be, the uh, there may be a veterinarian in the room that can uh, can help help, but I think it's it. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what are the factors that relate to listeria in beef cattle? And it's mostly in the silage. In the silage, yeah. And it's mostly the pH. And um, and I can't tell you exactly what the threshold is. You know, if you have good and and it, I think the the rate of fermentation may be part of that too, or you know the 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 timing and the drop of pH, there may be others that want to respond to that uh, as well. But listeria is suppressed by low pH. Moisture content is also a factor, you know, so if you, you know, like... Mike. Mo mo Mike. Yeah. Uh, moisture, uh, moisture content is also a factor, but certainly, yeah, the rate of pH drop, if you can get below five as quickly as possible, mm. listeria really dies off around five. Okay. So pH and the rate of pH drop, which is affected by moisture. Any other questions? Yes? On the spreadsheet that you showed for the NDF digestibility and the UNDF, do you know what time points are used? Um, 48. <laughs> yeah, the important thing is to be consistent. Uh, in this example, it was four, four, 48 hours is what we used. Yes. Is there, have you had talked that there's, you're thinking of doing some research with uh, effect of fiber using a hemp safe shaker box, I'm assuming. Is, is, I mean, the dairy industry has been using that for years. Any comments on, on, on certain uh, percentages on each level? Um, the question was on the Penn State shaker box about percentages in each level. Um, I don't have any thumb rules for that you know, on what makes a good silage in terms of, th you know, percentages on each level. I know the dairy industry does. Uh, I, I do think that though we can calculate an effective NDF and use that to, we've used, we've done some research on that with other forages other than corn silage and trying to estimate what level of effective NDF we would like to have in a, in a diet. Every nutritionist is going to have a little bit different number, but I think that may be a more precise number than just percent roughage. For example, um, how, how would you find those numbers? Or where's that at? The effective in the calculations that you're talking, speaking of. Do um, you have your app up? It's not available. Okay. Um, so it, it's the percentage that is in above four millimeters. I think is is the is the tray. So it's the percentage of the NDF in the feed that's above that is how we would calculate that. Other questions? <coughs> yes. With all the information that you had on corn silage, is there how much other information like that do you have, or would there be that we could get for haylages and uh, and even earlage for some of the fermentation profile? To have some real, so you can have some relative number to evaluate samples against. So the, the, the question that Eric had was the, the four samples we had on corn silage, how, mu how much, is there other information out there on haylages and other forage sources to compare to this? And um, a, bigger body. a bigger body of data. Um, we don't have that, but we, I think that's something that we would welcome people in this room helping us collect. You know, I think, 
if we took all the information that everyone, you know, samples that other people have of known problems, good and bad quality, we could certainly put that together. And some of the laboratories may compile some of that, um, but you don't, sometimes you don't know what regions they came from and there's some, you, you don't know all the information behind the samples. Okay, let's stop there and uh, let me find.